Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, um, and welcome to the Freedman Speaker Series. Uh, again, my name is Norbert Wilson. I'm uh, a faculty member here at the Freedman School, and today we're doing something a little different. Um, and I have to thank the, the Speaker Series Committee from the previous year that helped create this idea, and I just get to help carry it through. Um, so folks like Aaron Hennessy, Lauren Snow, uh, Jennifer Putz, uh, and I were on the committee last year, and one of the things that we thought would be interesting is, what if we actually use this as an opportunity to have a series, to, to think about a topic over multiple periods of time, and to have a culminating experience about that, sort of a capstone, if you will. And so today is that capstone for uh, a look at guidelines. Um, I will say probably most of today will be a discussion about dietary guidelines, but we will mention the physical fitness guidelines throughout uh, the session. Um, but the intent is to think carefully, creatively, or maybe not at all, uh, to think carefully or creatively about what the guidelines are, how they're developed, and what are the implications of the guidelines. Uh, so we are really blessed uh, here at the school to have uh, a number of great researchers who think about these issues and have been a part of the process of developing uh, at least the, the dietary guidelines. So I'm going to be quiet for a moment and ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about how they in their work have engaged in the dietary or the physical fitness guidelines in some way. We'll start off with Christina Fellows. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chris Economos. I'm a professor here at the school. And I'm going to really speak primarily about physical activity guidelines in my introductory remarks because I've been more involved with those. So you may have attended Russ Pate's lecture this year. He came to speak to us about his involvement in the guidelines. There have only been two sets of guidelines that have been released, 2008 and 2018. And there was a mid-course review in the middle. The 2008 guidelines, I served as a consultant and helped develop one of the chapters on bone health and on youth. And for the 2018 guidelines, I was not directly involved, um, but through some of the other work that I've done on other committees, um, know a lot of the people who were involved and, and stayed consistent with the process that they were going through. So I can talk today a lot about those. In terms of the dietary guidelines, I'm going to leave it to Alice to talk a lot about the process. But in terms of the implementation, certainly we use the dietary and physical activity guidelines in the intervention work that we do and really lean on those in the materials that we create, in the evidence-based strategies that we craft and test, and in any kind of promotional material. So they serve as a touchstone for the work that we do with children and families in making sure we're giving consistent evidence-based guidance. Hi, um, my name is Alice Lichtenstein. I'm the Gershoff Professor of Nutrition Science and Policy here at the school and the Director of the Cardiovascular Nutrition Laboratory over at the HNRCA. Um, so I have been involved with the Dietary Guidelines. I first served on the 2000 Dietary Guidelines Committee, and that was considered to be sort of the rebel committee because prior to that, the first guidelines were issued in 1980, and there were seven guidelines in 1985 and 90 and 95, and in 2000, we stepped back and we actually expanded it to 10 guidelines. Um, we did that because one of the guidelines had always said encourage more, uh, more intake or higher intake of fruits, vegetables, and grains. And we felt that the intake of grains in the United States was just fine, but fruits and vegetables was woefully low, which it still is. So we actually split that guideline. Um, we also split the guideline about um, maintaining a healthy body weight because that encompassed physical activity. And we recognized and wanted um, the government, essentially, and um, the policymakers to recognize that there's advantage of physical activity beyond body weight. So we split that guideline to be one on physical activity, one on body weight, and that's what really propelled the independent development of physical activity guidelines. Um, we also added a guideline on food safety um, in the sugar guideline where it was um, sort of something about moderating your sugar intake. We said in foods and beverages, controversial, but we got it in. And then in the grade, grain guideline, besides having a separate guideline, we said at least half 
whole grains, so introducing that concept. So anyway, that was my sort of introduction to dietary guidelines. And then in, for the 2015 guidelines, I was the vice chair of the committee. And between 2000 and 2015, the process had changed somewhat, and the format of the guidelines had changed somewhat. And certainly, as far as documentation, it had gotten very chubby, and as far as um, the way the guidelines were sort of presented got very wordy and chubby also. So the first thing I suggested is that it lose weight like everything else. Um, we did that slightly, but at any rate, um, I guess we'll eventually talk about the 2015, 2015 guidelines. But the dietary guidelines for Americans are um, all federal feeding programs, so that involves millions of people who are affected by the um, dietary guidelines for Americans. So that's everything from military to wheel, meals on wheel to school lunch. Um, how much they actually are impacting besides those programs conforming to the letter of the guidelines themselves. I'm not sure, but we'll, I assume we're going to be discussing that too. For sure. Jerry, please. Thank you all, um, and thank you all for being here today. So I'm Jerry Mann. I'm a professor of uh, practice here at the Friedman School. And, and as a practice means I'm here because of my uh, experience in the, in the field. And with dietary guidelines, I've worked in many positions throughout government uh, throughout my uh, career and actually was first exposed uh, before the guidelines in, in 1980. There were actually the, the U.S. goals that the Select Committee of Nutrition came up, and I, that happened about the time I finished my undergraduate degree in nutrition. I had the opportunity to, to visit with the, the Select Committee and, 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 and talk and work some with the staff at that point. And, and then throughout my career in, in the Congress, in, in the executive branch at FDA, at the White House, and most recently at USDA, um, they've certainly been something that we frequently uh, work with. Uh, but particularly at USDA, where I was in the Secretary's office as an appointee from 2009 uh, to 2017, and during that time, there were the 2010 and 2015 dietary guidelines. I'd say in the 2010, I was mostly involved in scrapping the pyramid with the colored stripes that uh, then Secretary Vilsack, strictly as a consumer trying to lose weight couldn't quite make sense of, and, and we replaced it with uh, the Mike Clay, and I, I worked on uh, that transition. And then 2015, you know, we had the, the full process and was involved with that in the Undersecretary's uh, office. Great. Thank you all for those introductions, and it's clear, I mean, we have a, a group of folks who are uh, intimately aware of the dietary guidelines and the physical fitness guidelines and their development. So this is a really uh, unique opportunity. And so there will be a time after this question that you can ask questions. Um, so I want to start off with something really basic. Why do we need guidelines? Just a little bit with nutrition. I'd love to hear your uh, take on why do we need guidelines. And Chris, I'd love to hear your thoughts on physical fitness. Well, um, we frequently talk about improving diet. We talk about out. We need to have some standards, and that's what I think led to initially the development of the dietary goals and then dietary guidelines. If I had one sure. point, you know, we, we were here just a couple of weeks ago. We did uh, the 50th anniversary of the White House Conference on Nutrition, and the dietary uh, goals and guidelines came out of uh, that. And so uh, that uh, conference and the issues at the time were principally around hunger, uh, but in particular after the conference, they created the Select Committee on uh, Nutrition in the Senate uh, that continued to meet um, for until 1977. And over time, they eventually turned to the role of diet and chronic disease, not just hunger. And at the conclusion of that, you know, it's it, it always somewhat extraordinary. In the same way, if uh, those who saw the video for the conference we did, where you heard uh, Bob Dole saying, you know, I wasn't that supportive initially of this, but when I sat and listened to all the hearings, I came away thinking we needed to address hunger. And in a similar way, and really an extraordinary way, because you think of Senator George McGovern of South Dakota, Bob Dole, Kansas, uh, they really represent states of strong agricultural interests, particularly around meat, for example. And yet they came out with these goals and ended up being the, sort of the first chapter of very political response to the goals, where these two senators uh, from these states came out with goals saying, do people should really eat less meat, which came about from there, just sitting in these hearings, listening to all the science at the time uh, around heart disease. And so that, that's kind of a fascinating o opening piece of that that then led to the process that we have today. And interestingly, you know, people, of course, immediately say, well, what are senators uh, doing? You know, making these statements, well, they should be the scientists, or could be so 
process, but it's interesting that you know they were really the first ones to say eat less, meat and that, and it took you know almost to, to 2015, even still to this day, to actually get the scientific process to be where uh, they were just as senators listening to the hearings. Hey Jerry, we're going to definitely talk about red meat in a little bit. So, uh, Chris, I remember doing the physical fitness test when I was a kid. Help us understand why do we need guidelines? This is great, and this is exactly the question I wanted to ask. Let's talk a little bit about the science that undergirds both the physical fitness guidelines and the dietary guidelines. It's a difficult, um, difficult. It's a complex, really thorough, rigorous process. One that's been called into some question. I want to hear a little bit about that process. And we have Frank Hu and, and Russ Pace who told us a little bit about it, but I want to hear your take on this process. Okay. Um, well. When the committee is convened, you're given charges. So you, the committee is told exactly what is expected of them and what the parameters are of those charges. So for the 2015 dietary guidelines, we were told that we would be developing what we felt were the important questions. And the criteria for that is whether there was significant scientific evidence that would suggest there should be a re-review from the prior guidelines, because it's clear you can't do everything. Um, in addition, for the review of the evidence, it was mandated that, well, it would be evidence-based, you might say. Obviously, however, it didn't used to have quite that um, level of precision as far as the charge to the committee, but also that it was clear, given the body of data available, it would be impossible for the staff available to actually evaluate all of the studies independently so that we would have to rely on 
prior systematic reviews or what's called an authoritative statement. So that's something that would come either from the government, the American Heart Association, Diabetes Association. Um, one of the other um, reasons behind that is they didn't want to see federal dollars used to duplicate work that had previously been done. Um, so those were the sort of parameters that we worked with. Then if there was additional data that went beyond what the authoritative statements and the prior systematic reviews um, had included, then we could add that. Now in terms of the systematic reviews, the published systematic reviews, we didn't use all of them. There are systems that are used to actually grade the quality of a systematic review, and that was done by the NEL Nutrition Evaluation Library. Um, and they had to, each systematic review that was considered by the committee was had to meet a certain minimum standard in terms of that system to evaluate the quality. Um, so then when we got all those data, then it was a matter of coming up first with a um, conclusion statement, and you can read them all in the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee report. For each question, there was a conclusion statement. And then from that, we wrote an implication statement. And the implication statement was sort of our advice to the federal government who was going to write the Dietary Guidelines, because we were told quite clearly from the get-go that the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee does not write the Dietary Guidelines. That happens within USDA and HHS. They share that responsibility and pull in other individuals. Um, so in addition to the implication, so this is conclusion statement, the implication statement, we then give it a grade, the strength of the evidence, and there's a clear rubric that's also provided in terms of how strong the evidence is to support the conclusion and the implications. And then we document where the data that were used to produce the implication and conclusion statements actually were derived. Now, occasionally, um, we also had um, information for data analysis, that, that, but everything that we used had to either go through this process or be done by the NEL, the Nutrition Evaluation Library. So at one point, um, one of the members had done a systematic review on an issue that we were particularly interested in, and that could not be used that because it wasn't done by the NEL. Why? Because with the NEL, the Nutrition Evaluation Library, all searches are publicly available, so you can go on the website and see it. The reason for including or excluding any specific study in the systematic review and potentially meta-analysis has to be documented. So that this is supposed to be the most transparent system possible until the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee gets dissolved when we hand the secretaries the um, report, and then it's a black box to figure out how they came up with the Dietary Guidelines, but that's something else. That is an important point, and you made it very clear, but I, I just want to emphasize. The committee looks at the science, comes up with the ideas about the science, and then someone else handles the actual recommendations. And that's something before I came to the Freedom School I didn't appreciate, so this is really important. Chris, can you tell us about the physical fitness plan? Very similar. Um, in this case, it was they followed the format, actually, so it's the same health and human services um, development that comes from in this case, there were 17 members, so I think fairly similar people are nominated and then they become appointed after the vetting and they're from different disciplines and they work together to review systematic reviews, this case over a 10-year period, and augment with any emerging uh, data that might be coming out. In this case, particularly in the area of cognition for children and dementia for older adults, where those are really emerging areas, um, and also as pregnancy, as I mentioned before. and they went down this time for preschoolers. So the um, recommendations in the past kind of started at school-age children, and now there are more data telling us what two, three, and four-year-olds should actually be accruing. So some really interesting uh, work as well in cancer areas mm -hmm. that in the past they hadn't uh, associated with physical activity, and now they are. So very similar process, controlled essentially the same way. Um, and I would say 
I think like the dietary guidelines, behavioral scientists and people who are really thinking about um, uh, promotion and translation and intervention work, there was a bigger emphasis this time on that. I want to talk at some point about the difference in uh, all of this being more volunteer. Um, and what I mean by that is we have a school meals program where there's a link to the dietary guidelines and there's a lot of money that goes out to fund our nutrition programs in the country that link to the dietary guidelines with reimbursement. It's different for physical activity. There's no school district saying, I'm following the guidelines and we're delivering it two days a week will you pay us or reimburse us a certain amount for that? So that's a distinction, and which makes this whole area seem more voluntary. I'm generalizing here, but it's, right. it's, it's, it's different. Do you then think that there's a difference in how the guidelines are followed in terms of physical yeah. fitness? Well, I mean, Alice can speak to the dietary part, but you know, 80% of Americans aren't following the physical activity guidelines. I think if you look at the Healthy Eating Index, it's probably similar. So, you know, whether you're using it in a more uh, structured way or whether you're putting out those voluntary guidelines, just words on paper aren't necessarily translating the way we'd want into behavior and into health. Yeah. But, yeah, it's 80%. Okay. And it's really uh, even, I would say, in the younger years when we think about kids move a lot. Yeah. You know, it's, by high school, it's about 40%. Well, there's another, there's another issue about that. High schools make it really hard for the non-top athletes, but that's another issue. But as far as the dietary guidelines, if a school wants federal funding to support the, um, their school lunch program or anything else, they don't have a choice. They have to follow it. It is mandatory. Jerry, I know you want to get in. No, I just want to point out, you know, spoke about, <laughs> the, the, you know, the, the, I, mean, I, I mentioned before the White House Conference and School Act Committee, and, then, and there are, though, there throughout history, it, it, you know, there are the laws that come with that, and then the agencies come up with regulations, and they spell out a process. So it's not that it's, um, you know, um, scattered, or it's, I mean, there is that, you can follow that. And, and here, what you see is you start off with, again, some amendments, it's laws that you might have the dietary guidelines, you go back and look at the pamphlet. It was really addressed to the American people um, as an effort to help them, um, you know, that they should be eating. And over time, though, and again, first through the laws and the regulations that come up to implement the laws, a, a shift uh, occurred, and it became that. And today's dietary guidelines are no longer aimed at public; they're aimed at uh, folks like you all, that they're professionals in the field who then uh, translate that into a policy for the public. And again. The statutes through the regs. It also changed from when the, the scientific committee essentially got to write it, so they just did an advisory report that then the secretary uh, gets to write the final report. Um, and, and but the impact is quite significant. So um, you know, essentially every federal program that involves uh, food um, has to uh, follow what the dietary guidelines say. So if you think about it in, in terms of impact, USDA you know, has as a result again of the, the White House conference. of USDA's budget is spent on feeding programs, and that's uh, over $100 billion, which would be in the eight-month year. And those programs, um, some, um, most, are driven by the dietary guidelines, but then the very largest in SNAP, food stamps, and so on, is, is not. Um, but in the ones that are, that they're quite impactful. So if you think, um, I have you know, worked at USDA with Mr. Obama trying to change the same generation address first you could say, well, how can we possibly imagine doing that with the newborn generation? But the dietary guidelines shape the WIC program, where 52% of infants are on uh, WIC. A USDA has a child care feeding program, where a third of the kids in child uh, care are uh, governed by the school. And then there's a school meal program that covers you know, 50 million virtually all of the school kids. And to give you an example, as a result then of those guidelines, and with school meals, we know they do a big, large cost study that shows what's the um, result of the program. And it's worked out with the last one, Straddle, as we update the school meals program. And we can see that prior to that, 58% um, um, the healthy eating index score what was being served on trays. And so it was typical of what was American. 
What's extraordinary is after those new regulations are in place, in large part driven by the dietary guidelines, that score raises 40 percent, a score of 81 of what's on trays. And plate waste didn't go up, so it definitely had a big impact. So thinking about it, sometimes these are overwhelming, but in the real world how this plays out is if you have the guidelines, they can inform the programs. It might be nice to have SNAP there as well. But until that happens, just with WIC, child care, feeding, and school meals alone, you can make a significant difference in a large subset of children especially, which, again, thinking about it in a generation can have a big impact. This is really helpful because what you helped me to understand is that the guidelines aren't typically public-facing. I mean, it is, like you said, uh, for us as professionals. And we clearly see how the guidelines show up in things like school meals and WIC. But in physical activity, as you pointed out, Chris, there's nothing uh, associated with the guidelines in terms of federal funding. So how can Americans learn about the guidelines? How do we, how do we engage the guidelines? Uh, physical there, there's another document called the physical, National Physical Activity Plan, and that's yet another way to translate it and to encourage and recruit uh, professionals at every level um, to implement physical activity. Mm -hmm. um, it's really challenging. I yeah. mean, a lot of it is, you know, like food, but driven by the environment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, nobody really wants to stand in place and do exercise. And so you have to have a built environment that actually supports it. So when you're talking about schools, you know, for funding reasons, schools were often built with what we call a Catholic gymatorium, which yes. is one space where yeah. you do a lot of different things, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's not available throughout the day. So there's a lot more effort now toward classroom break activity, and I should add that there's a substantial amount of evidence now showing even if you do, in a classroom, get up and move a little bit, you're able to accrue some benefits. But mm -hmm. it's been really challenging, which is why another whole field has developed on the built environment. And that's really over the past decade that there's an extraordinary amount of literature now talking about how we lay out our environment and using GIS and other technology we can really quantify and also predict the likelihood of someone's ability to accrue minutes of physical activity based on where they're located. Mm -hmm. So it's another kind of zip code study where we think a lot about zip code with health. One of those social determinants is actually your built environment and can you actually move it all. So mm -hmm. it, it's very, very challenging and you know we have work going on in our group that really focuses on trying to understand how you actually deliver quality mm -hmm. physical activity and um, it's, it's, it's a lot more chaotic, I would say, than mm -hmm. systematic when it comes to diet. Mm -hmm. And people are really trying to be innovative. And you see the technology field exploding with devices, right, which some of you may have on right now. Those are going to become even a lot more popular as mm -hmm. well because they're motivational. If you look at behavioral science, people get motivated by actually looking at immediate feedback. Mm -hmm. You know, it's harder with diet unless you're drawing your blood immediately and looking inside. But... You have to kind of wait to see, did my blood pressure change? Do I feel a little better? But at the end of the day, you can see I burned 3,000 calories. I walked 10,000 steps. And, you know, that's, that's real. So that's pretty motivating for people. So there's lots of strategies, and the new guidelines have a whole chapter on this. But I would say those of us who've been in the field for a long time, you know, continue to be frustrated because there isn't good funding. Mm -hmm. And as you, we talked about, there aren't really programs. So I'll end by saying you'll see some school districts that offer it physical education one day a week where the kids are getting maybe 12 minutes of activity. Yeah. They should be getting 60 minutes a day. And you'll see some school districts that are offering it five days, extremely rare. Mm -hmm. Most of the time you'll see it about a day a week. So mm -hmm. it's up to other people in the community to pick up that slack. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder, are, do you see those differences along um, areas of disparity. And so, so I want to raise this issue uh, of the dietary guidelines, the physical fit, uh, fitness guidelines in terms of the creation, how well do they address issues of, around health disparities, and also in the implementation. So let's start off with the, the dietary guidelines. Uh, how do you all deal with that, or how is it rather the committee dealt with the issues around health disparities? Well, there's certainly a recognition of issues related to health disparities. Um, because beyond just having places to be physically active and to be safe and having places to be physically active, 
um, the dietary guidelines themselves, that's essentially considered beyond the scope. That's not part of the charge. And so uh, beyond, you know, having food deserts. So, it's, so it was recognized in terms of the food environment. And we spent a fair amount of time in um, talking about the food environment and default options. And if you're going to recommend people do certain things, then they might as well be available. And it was quite clear from the data that social and economic disparities impacted the ability to adopt the guidelines. But that is a separate issue. And I think appropriately because you can't have any one document or one, any one effort. Um, if it tries to address absolutely everything, I think things get diluted. So the dietary guidelines provided the basis for what the aim should be as far as absolute implementing them. That goes to another level with people I think that have more expertise. Sure, I'd okay. say also scope. You can't creep out of the scope. Sure. And there is an actual guideline around um, key guidelines for safe physical activity. It doesn't really get at the neighborhood issue that we started to touch on a little bit. It's really more about if you have a chronic disease, your healthcare provider has to give very specific recommendations to make sure that you're safe, or you should be under the supervision of someone, you know, if you're taking on exercise, have a stress test before you go out and run by yourself if you've had a stent put in. That's just an example. So it, it doesn't really touch on it the same way. They talked about it in the scientific report that they considered it. Mm -hmm. And I'd say where it really comes out is when they're looking at data with different populations. And, you know, we've done some of that to look at whether there are certain things that predict, you know, the adoption and the maintenance of physical activity and what might be the drivers of someone's in inability to do that which um, is complicated, yeah. right? Because it's a zip code issue and there's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's an economic issue and it's an education issue. It, it gets really complicated. So I'd say they couldn't creep out of scope as we would hope they would, but in the National Physical Activity Plan, that's where they really get into more of the issues around disparities. I'll give you an example about creeping out of scope. So we, the 2015 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee, addressed um, or considered issues related to sustainability and the environment. And the Secretary of Agriculture, Visick, um, certainly criticized us and told us that we behaved like his grandchildren who were coloring outside the lines of a, cook, of a coloring book. Now, I will say, as with physical activity and what happened in the 2000 dietary guidelines, where we included physical activity, and, and some of us said, why physical activity in the 2000 dietary guidelines, except that we really wanted to separate it from the, the weight control, that did spawn other guidelines with a, developed by a group of people that had the expertise to do that. I think with the sustainability environmental issues, Hopefully that, well, the 2015 committee did and sort of got their hands slapped. Mm -hmm. um, I think that will hopefully spawn efforts, guidelines in those areas, and will include people that really have expertise in that area. Yeah. No, I was, was going to say just okay. quickly, is it just staying on to Alice's remark about coloring outside the lines? Um, um, right after the secretary uh, stated that I was driving from our house and we passed up. I passed a private school, and they had a big sign advertising, you know, for enrollment. And, and their their sign basically said, "Come to our private school and learn where your kids can color outside the lawn." <laughs> and so I took a picture of that, and I, I brought it in to uh, uh, the secretary and uh, shared that with him. But um, um, but also, you know, what Chris was saying. I mean, we literally, you know, when when our kids were young and entering the public school. Um, we went and talked to the public school near our house and asked them about physical activity. And, and they said, you know, they, we try to do recess once a day if the weather's not bad, you know, maybe 15 minutes. But, I mean, we literally ended up sending our kids to private school because, you know, there they guaranteed you with the after school maybe three hours of being outside a day. And so it is something that's really not available to everyone as well. Okay. I wanted to pick up on another thing that comes out of an activity like this, and that is, other groups take it on. And so you made a comment about by the time you're in high school, it's elite athletes who get the field time and the attention and the support and the reinforcement and the accolades. And the rest of the kids who aren't playing have to figure out how to do it or they don't. 
So there is a national initiative called Project Play, which is out of the Aspen Institute, which mm -hmm. is really focused on getting all kids to move in a variety of ways. So it's not a federal initiative, but it was something that came out of the fact that um, there's a, a lack of um, evidence and enthusiasm around just providing the funding and the, the space for kids to be able to play. And that can be a whole variety of things that you don't necessarily have a uniform on and you're getting school funding for. Okay. Well, that is important. Um, I want to change the subject and I want to talk about our controversy. And it was already breached, uh, but I, I want to bring it up and, and it's about red meat. Um, there have been news reports of scientists who have said that the dietary guidelines, and correct me if I misstate it, um, have been misplaced in terms of our consumption of red meat and I guess processed meats also. But uh, could you tell us a little bit about what that is? And, I, I, and Jerry, I want you to chime in. Um, I want to think about what that means for the credibility of the guidelines in general. Tell us, please. Well, I'm certainly familiar with it because <laughs> about five days before the sixth um, report or ma our manuscripts came out in the Annals of Internal Medicine, a lot of us were bombarded by um, reporters. And essentially, for those of you that are unaware, there were three systematic reviews, two narrative reviews, and one editorial um, about red meat. And this is, was a self um, constituted group of individuals that decided to review the issue of red meat and reviewed and published these papers um, and actually made specific recommendations. Um, the, the, and, the, and theoretically, they had no conflict of interest, but then it became apparent that they did, and it was the same researcher who also found that there was no relationship between added sugar and health outcomes. But I can give you an example with the red meat and processed meat. One of the criticisms of the 2015 Dietary Guidelines Committee is that we didn't distinguish between red and processed meat. The reason we didn't do that is because most of the studies didn't. Because when the food frequency questionnaires were first formulated, it was red and processed meat. So if you don't have the data, even if you have a feeling that maybe there are reasons why you should focus more on processed meat than red meat, you can't do that because these are evidence-based guidelines. The recommendation is for any tool moving forward to assess diet that you split those two out. Anyway, so this group of scientists, and I don't know exactly what precipitated their um, activities, but I was most focused on the one that related to red meat and um, cardiovascular disease outcomes. If you read that article, their recommendations of that there's a weak relationship between red and processed meat and cardiovascular outcomes was uh, made on the basis of one single study that qualified for their evidence review and that was the Women's Health Initiative, which did not test the hypothesis. The Women's Health Initiative started in the 90s, and it was designed primarily to test the relationship between total fat and breast cancer, and then they also included cardiovascular disease. It was developed during the period of time that low-fat diets were recommended. And the intervention was to get women to substitute grains, fruits, and vegetables for dietary fat with no specificity on type of dietary fat. And the authors rated that as weak evidence. They did not include some of the intervention studies that actually were very, provided very strong evidence for a link between substituting saturated fat with polyunsaturated fat. It's not exactly clear. But when you do an evidence review, for those of you that have done it, you come up first with inclusion A, exclusion criteria a priori for your literature search. Then you identify the literature, and then for each study, you determine whether it meets the inclusion and exclusion criteria. So, for whatever reason, that's what their recommendation was. And you don't make a recommendation. It's irresponsible to make a recommendation on the basis of a single study. So, exactly, but it certainly got a lot of press. And it's through, and it did. I think there are a lot of things that undermine the dietary guidelines. If you look at the dietary guidelines, yeah, I would have written them differently than the federal government did. Little things, little tweaks. 
but I don't think that that's what's particularly would be particularly useful to discuss in public because essentially they're rec- it's recommending a healthy dietary pattern, right? A lot of people, as soon as they came out, criticized this little thing and that little thing. I would have done this. I don't agree with that. Whereas the committee was locked in to appropriately to evidence based. That serves to undermine the dietary guidelines. Then you have this rogue group coming out with stuff like this, it further undermines it. And I think it's really unfortunate. I I think we're, there's the First Amendment rights, we certainly can free speech and everyone should be able to give their opinion. On the other hand, I think when we think of the general good, sometimes we, we do lose the Forest for the trees, is that it? Yeah, forest for the trees. You know, we we focus, we sort of fixate on these little things and not the big things. But um, it's actually turned out to be somewhat of a flash in the pan. So we'll see what happens. Sure, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the policy implications of what does it mean to right. have. We well, you know it's interesting. I mean, there's, this has been a big controversy. I'm sure many here have thought about. You know, can the Department of Agriculture be counted on? Uh, to set um, a standards to do on these things. After all, aren't they, you know, as I described before, you know, in the pocket of the meat industry, all of these other agricultural interests? Um, and, and, you know, and I think it is an uh, important question and, and one that I've uh, lived throughout my career. But I, I think at the end of the day, you know, my own view on it is, and, and it's hard to come up and figure out what the right answer is because there is no question, and we're living through a period right now um, where you have a Secretary of Agriculture who, you know, set out to destroy, you know, and this is, you know, there's no question about this, destroy the Economic Research Service and National Institute of Food and Agriculture because they weren't happy with some of the science that they were doing. You know, and, and, and having worked in government a long time, I don't think it's thinkable that a Secretary of Health and Human Services would do something uh, similar. So on the one hand, you have things like uh, that. And, and you can point to examples throughout history where there have been Secretaries of Agriculture who have acted in, in, in that sort of uh, way. On the other hand, you look at the programs. You know, I had the privilege when I was at, in, in Health and Human Services at FDA. We did the Nutrition Facts label. You know, it ha- it's had some impact. and it, it affects some consumers. It probably affects even more companies than what they put in the products. But there's nothing like, you know, USDA's resources. In all the places I've worked in government, no, you know, it's the only place I've worked where you really have the resources uh, to do your uh, Job. So when on that FDA, you'd like to do a lot more. You just don't have the resources uh, to do it. And, and an example I'll give in food safety is that um, there was an outbreak of uh, E. coli bacteria um, in the Clinton nation, administration Jack in the Box where kids were getting sick and, and dying. And, and at that time, the rate of those infections of sugar toxin E. coli infections were 8 per 100,000. And um, I you know, worked with the, the White House on that, Al Gore, and we basically changed the way that USDA does food safety by importing, I was at FDA at the time, when we sort of imported the FDA approach to food safety to USDA. And then when I came back to USDA and the Obama administration to oversee food safety, that had dropped from eight cases per 100,000 down to less than about one per 100,000, an extraordinary uh, result in terms of human safety. And, and today, they're probably, based on CDC, they're, you know, it, all the deaths that they know about in a year related to food safety, uh, that many people die every day because of poor quality diets. You, you look at USDA, and as I said before, on the one hand, there are these conflicts, and they're real, and so what do you do about that? On the other hand, they have, you know, in their resources, what I described before in terms of food, WIC, child care, school meals, how they, you know, in a way that no other agency in government uh, can change the way people eat. And so that's where I'm always conflicted. I keep, um, when I was there, I keep feeling if you could import into FNS the kind of nutrition thinking that nutrition experts would bring um, that and, and allow that to help shape the policies in FNS. And to, and to a large degree, they do because of the dietary guidelines and other things. But the leaders in those programs are mostly outstanding administrators. That's what they hire. And I, I'll make a pitch to you all because in, 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 in many instances, uh, particularly agriculture, in the position to hire people. I mean, one of the biggest challenges is people don't really see that as a, a career path. So you have, you know, Chris, Alice, the great work they do. They extraordinary help in the work that I did in government by serving on committees, by doing the research to get the answers. That's essential. We always rely on it. But if the people asking the questions don't bring the same expertise to it, it results in programs that are not as effective. 
So I have lots, uh, a lot more questions to ask, but I think it's really a good time for us to open this up to the audience. Uh, if you have a question, um, we're going to bring some mics out so that people can uh, ask a question. And as we're getting ready for that, I want to just seed one question, and that has to do with um, who's on the committee. And we talked a little bit about the concern about um, influence from outside sources, and uh, what would be the implications, or how would it look if there were food industry representatives or folks from the exercise and physical fitness uh, professional world involved in the physical fitness guidelines or the dietary guidelines that we talked isn't there a role for them to have a, a voice in this? Or, excuse me, what about having NGOs or nonprofit organizations, not academics, also engaged in the, the, the review or the discussion about the policies? I think I mentor a question just a little bit proud because I'd be interested in your point of view. So, you know, they do, people make recommendations that in the end the department picks the, the people. I'm, I'm curious if you think, you know, if you look at the 2015 versus the 2020, you can look at 2020 in this administration and see that all of the, you know, many of the people there had multiple industry, um, you know, nominations that went with them. On the other hand, most people told me they felt it's still a pretty good committee. So I'm wondering is, you know, what, what, what did, we, did we witness this time? Just a lot of people who wanted to get on it figured, well, in this administration, it probably would help to have an industry letter as well. In the same way we all get recommendations letter, maybe it would be a good idea to get three or four industry letters where in the last administration, maybe it wasn't helpful to have that? Or do you think there's more industry influence in this dietary guideline? Okay, I, I have absolutely no first-hand knowledge of that, so I really can't tell you. I can tell you what the process is, and unfortunately that's a black box process also, that in the Federal Register there is a notice that goes out requesting nominations for the committee. Um, people, I guess you can self-nominate, but Usually, your peers will nominate you. You know that because you have to send an abbreviated CV in, um, and so usually they're asking you to help. But they also, you're supposed to, for people who nominate, you're supposed to check with the person to make sure that if they're chosen, they're willing to serve. Okay, well, they see, so the question is do I know who nominated me? I actually wanted to know. And so I asked, after I was appointed, could I, you know, I'd like to sort of thank them. And I was told, no, that's the black box. I know that the New York City Health Department nominated me because they had contacted me for information. I know that CSPI did. I know that the former chair of the prior committee did. And I believe the Heart Association did. I know because of the Freedom of Information Act that there was a certain amount of activity that was going on um, between outside entities. And the reason for that is there was, a, there was a lot of controversy over what we wrote about cholesterol. And the New York Times and some of the other um, news organizations, what's called Fora, requested, and I got Fora five times, which means you, all the, your emails have to be turned over. But anyway, they got it from the egg board and those associated things. And then the New York Times reporter gave it all to me because he wanted me to comment on it. And I actually got to see a comment that they made about me, which was that she's a wild card. She can't be predicted. And I thought, yes! <laughs> that was one of the sweetest things I had ever read. <laughs> um, as far as potential conflicts of interest in industry, you get... Um, reviewed very carefully before you're put on the committee and then any potential conflicts of interest um, are, are actually, or appearance of conflicts of interest, there's a decision and that goes into whether you're going to be appointed um, and it also becomes public information. Because I've spent my career doing a lot of this policy stuff, I really try to avoid conflicts of interest and it's just sort of a professional decision that I made. I know that there are, that, that there are always people saying, oh, this, this one was, you know, might have conflict of interest or that one, but there's really no way of us knowing. Now, as far, though, I think what's really important is your question about uh, industry representatives or GMOs, you know, something, I think that it has to be a separate group. And the reason for that is I do agree that these guidelines should be based on science and um, evidence-based 
science. And the group of people that know how to work within that sphere, and that's where our training is, are the scientific community. There can be other determinants, and that might be what industry can provide. It might be what the impact is on the environment. But that is separate from developing evidence-based guidelines, unless the charge to the committee went beyond or was not to develop evidence-based guidelines, but to focus on implementation, then I could see a role for the other professionals. Chris. Is it activity guidelines, science-based? I mean, if you look at this document, you'd need a certain type of training to participate in those conversations. But absolutely in the translation, and the National Physical Activity Plan is inclusive. Mm -hmm. It's multi-sector, and they really think about who is it going to take. You need shoes. You need, I mean, right. you need manufacturing. You need a lot that re beyond just words. Okay, great. I'm sure there's got to be questions. First one. Well, that's the black box. Um, that's, I, you know, I would love, I mean, you sort of can guess it's the major, well, you know, the, the major people in HHS and USDA, but I know others are um, pulled in. You know, we could all speculate. I can't imagine what the advantage would be for there to be um, outside influence, but certainly that's something that always comes up and actually a report, I don't know if anyone else around here got contacted about four weeks ago, that was the exact question they came up with. How We don't know. I mean, what we do know in the case of the physical activity guidelines is what's in the first two pages. So they do list, you know, the folks within HHS that were part of this, that were on the writing team, and additional writing team members and acknowledgments. So at least there's some transparency in terms of the names of the folks, but I imagine there's a lot more that goes on that is black box, but there's some. I think a lot of it, you know, I mean, it is true you can call it a black box, but I, I think it is, right, it's because of a change in the law. Um, the, you know, there's the, the an advisory committee, but the two secretaries who are the two top policy officials of the president appoints in this area do oversee the creation of the guidelines and then ultimately make the sign off on it. And, um, you know, there are um, staffs in both the Department of Agriculture and services who are charged uh, with working on it. Those are our career staff. I think they're scientists that Alice could agree are, 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 are you know, first very respected, first-rate scientists. I think overall, my experience, uh, particularly at the federal government, is you're not going to find a higher quality level employee in, in most of the positions that uh, are working on. Um, you know, there, there's some that's a little hard to see, you know, who came in and met with various uh, uh, folks. Those meetings are documented. Sometimes you can't get them unless you employ them. Uh, sometimes you can. Some things are more obvious. I think, you know, Alice noted that um, you had uh, an advisory committee that recommended a telegraph from 2010, but then in 2015 that sustainability was going to be a big issue in these dietary <coughs> guidelines. Um, it wasn't that much of a black box. The Secretary of Agriculture, Bill Sack, um, probably you know, took the position he did on it, decided not to put it in it because there was a Congress of the other party that called him up there and was screaming and yelling at him. And he could probably see that, you know, these, not only are these guys yelling at me, they actually fund my department. They fund my budget. And so if I'm going to pick a fight with them, it's, you know, it's kind of like picking a fight with your boss. I don't know how it's not going to uh, turn out. So, you know, in the end, um, he made a judgment that I think was um, a difficult even for him because I think, you know, he clearly believes in climate change and wanting to do something about it. On the other hand, realizing that, again, it wasn't the advisory committee, it wasn't there was a science legend, um, but it, and it wasn't really a black box. We had that from the black elected representatives who were making it clear that, you know, if you put this in the dietary guidelines, uh, there will be a big price of it. And, and there wasn't even already, even what happened, the, the process has really changed. So 
um, you know, they called the Institute of Medicine a review. They've made a lot of changes. Again, there's a process. You can look at it in power coverage. You'll see a lot of these changes are, are, are more, make things more transparent. They all seem to make sense. I can tell you from where I sit as a policymaker, someone who tries to see these things through, it makes it so much more cumbersome, more difficult to do. Um, it, it, it's not because it's so complicated. So, I, you know, I think, and that was part of the fight, even though that um, Bill Sack ran away from it as quickly as he could and tried to just sort of say, look, you guys won. I'm the only thing you say, color, uh, whatever, whatever statements to kind of ridicule, to, you know, to try to show that he's on their side, uh, they still didn't completely buy it, right? They kind of know where he's coming from. They just saw how the process worked, and they made uh, changes to see if they can avoid it in the future. Right, but in terms of the IOM, uh, review of the process, but what actually was not implemented. There was there's no mandatory implementation of that for 2020, so I'm not sure much of that actually happened. But what did happen is after the guidelines were released, um, the agriculture bill was up, and I think it was what is it, amendment or something, 734. Somebody put in to the agriculture bill that the 2015 guidelines couldn't be released if there were any changes from 2010 that didn't meet the highest standard of um, rating, which was A. And this was all sort of post hoc, and it never passed. But it's really, the shenanigans are quite amazing. Now, in order to protect the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee, there were a couple public meetings. When there were public meetings, there was a rope between us and the public. And we were shuttled into one room for lunch, and they were shuttled into something else. So there's sort of a lot of little stuff that goes on. Great. We'll let this be the last question. Um, so with very few Americans meeting the recommendations for exercise and nutrition, and Chris, you had mentioned the built environment for exercise, but what opportunities do you see for food environments in exercise environments, both policy and then maybe research gaps to get to a place where we are creating those healthy food environments and exercise environments? I can give a good one with, with trans fatty acids. That's, that's sort of an environmental thing that first New York City banned the use of partially hydrogenated fat, the major source of trans fatty acids in the U.S. diet. Eventually, it became um, national. So now the default option is the healthier option because it's off the grass list. Personally, we know that education is great and we've had these guidelines around. I very strongly feel we have to have mandatory food and nutrition education in the, all the schools, hunting and gathering in the 21st century. But that has not taken, it hasn't got a lot of steam. But, it, but if we're going to tell people since we have, since 2000, to eat more whole grains as opposed to refined grains, yet think of any restaurant you go to, any venue, the amount of whole grain relative to white flour and white tortillas and white bread and all that stuff far exceeds. So if the default option isn't going to be the healthier option, I don't think we have much chance of changing right now, really in increasing the quality. And the same thing with the amount of fruits and vegetables that you get when you go out to a restaurant or something like that. Chris, we're at the end, but I would love for you to respond. Sure. I'll just add something that might be helpful. They spent a lot of effort in this to make sure people understood that light physical activity, not just moderate to vigorous. And, and Dan Hatfield, who's in the audience, actually some of his dissertation addressed this, is also important. And incrementally, every minute makes a difference. And Russ may have showed a slide. If you go from zero minutes to five, there's an actual pretty steep increase, five to ten even more. So it's not even just built environment, go out and run, accrue 30 minutes. It's, it's zero to one to five. And the second comment is we could do more here. So we have guidelines at the school around nutrition. Um, I go to meetings in Washington at the academies where I serve. We always do standing applause. We always take physical activity breaks, even if it's three minutes in our chairs and people put on some music. I mean, these are important people that are doing this. but. I feel like we're, we have walking group here, but we're not practicing what we preach. And every minute that you're sitting versus you're being active accrues over time and makes a big difference. So built environment, re-engineer, how we move is key, but we can do a lot on a daily basis right here in this work environment. That's your cue to stand up and yeah. applaud us. <laughs> Let's thank our, uh, our panelists.
Thank you all, and uh, we will be back next week. Have a great time.